I'm Nick Savine. I'm a senior solution architect working with the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, or NGA. And today I have with me James Cherry with NGA and Andy Heifetz, CEO of AmpSite, the Red Hat partner. And they're here to talk about the mission of NGA, what they do, all the cool work they do to support um, disaster relief in, in uh, our country. And also um, talk about some of the challenges and uh, of OpenShift as a hybrid cloud strategy and challenges of getting that in a disconnected environment on to the edge. So James, uh, please. Thank you. All right, thanks, Nick. Um, today we'll actually be discussing three things. Um, what is GeoInt? Um, our hybrid cloud strategy, and as Nick said, uh, some challenges and lessons learned along the way. My name is James Cherry. I worked 21 years in uh, the private sector before coming over to NGA. Um, I'm currently heading up our high performance computing program within our uh, storage and compute division, and our role is to ensure um, our customers, both internally and externally, can ingest, process, and analyze as quickly and efficiently as possible. Brief introduction of um, NGA. NGA is a National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, and its mission is to provide geospatial intelligence, or GEOINT, for our nation's security. We are a valued customer combat support agency and principal member of the intelligence community with diverse customers and mission sets. We use GEOINT to provide decision-making advantage to warfighters, first responders, and policymakers, but still, what is GEOINT? GeoWint is the use of imagery, imagery intelligence, and geospatial information to describe and depict features, activities, and locations on Earth. GeoWint is more than the use of imagery. It's, combining, it's combining, combining multiple sources to create a comprehensive picture. Basically, if you have a point and location on Earth, if you can map it, if you can chart it, if you can reference it spatially, it's GeoWint. GeoWint tells you where exactly something or someone is, what it is, and why it's important. This slide further illustrates the layer of GeoWint data that we ingest, analyze, and process. We have the ability to process publicly available social media, that's important, such as Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, commercially provided imagery which supports close-up navigation planning and urban area operations, street level data, topography, which provides a certain level of detail for ground operations, geography, ocean data such as currents, reef locations and water depth, and terrain, which provides changes in elevation and slope in any, undul in any undulations in the environment. Um, now I want to go into um, we had some really cool stuff as well, fireworks and everything else, but since a lot of what we do is classified, you end up with this. <laughs> <laughs> this is um, how we actually um, use our ongoing efforts to provide support to first responders and our government partners, and we're going to show you a few examples of NGA's role in providing HADAR, or Humanitarian Assist in Disaster Relief. On this slide, we have a flooding event from a, actually a couple of months ago at um, Offutt Air Force Base in Nebraska, and we're able to use imagery to help assess damage as well as assist with recovery efforts for agencies such as FEMA. So if you look down at the bottom, you'll see where we can focus in on a couple of hangars um, that flooded. I think the waters got up to about seven feet, and we can determine, okay, what was in those hangars? What do we need to get out of there? What do we need to focus on in actually doing our recovery efforts. Uh, here we have a, um, a volcanic event in Hawaii on Mount Kilauea, where there were two craters that either collapsed or started to drain. And imagery helped not only with the evacu evacuation of residents, but also how it could possibly affect the disposition of the power plant that you'll see at the top um, in that particular area. Um, here we have the Mendocino Fire in California. Uh, this fire was first reported on July 27, 2018, but it wasn't actually fully contained until almost two months later, I believe on September 18th. 
Once again, we use imagery to help damage assessment and recovery operations. Um, here, you can see where a tornado ripped a swath right through the city of uh, Moore, Oklahoma back in 2013. Uh, this was an E5 tornado with winds um, above 200 miles per hour. The tornado stayed on the ground for approximately 37 minutes and was over one mile in diameter at its peak. Um, by being able to chart that path of that tornado, we're able to assist first responders with focusing on where the most damage is and to try to disaid in any recovery that we can. Um, this particular slide, you'll see a set of images of a before and after of a flooding event in Monat, North Dakota in 2011. Um, this was an event that was predicted to happen every two to 500 years, but yet here we are. Um, and we're able to see the before and after, and we get that kind of imagery to see how bad um, the damage actually is. This slide right here is our world according to GeoWind, land, sea, air, science, and geography. Uh, we have 196 square kilometers of precise stereo and mono-orthorectified imagery, um, 70 million hydrographic features, air, 4 billion aeronautical data elements, and if you look at that second bullet, 32 million vertical um, obstructions. That could be antennas, that could be uh, power lines, that could be smokestacks, just a variety of vertical obstructions. Um, science, 125 million gravity records, and geography, 11 million geographic names. Um, and now I'm gonna pass this over to Andy Heifetz, who's gonna go through the rest of um, our presentation. Ah, great. Thank you. All right. Let's go. Great, thank you for that great introduction to Geo and James. Yeah, as James just talked about, there's a massive volume of data and compute resources uh, we need to support these life-saving missions. So stop for a second and ask yourself, how would you manage all the required storage and compute infrastructure? How can you apply Kubernetes and OpenShift to support disaster relief? You know, our hybrid cloud center identified five key areas where we can use Kubernetes and OpenShift. I'll give you a quick overview of some of these areas and then we'll dive into two areas in more detail. The first is cloud native development. As James said, our expertise is GeoInt. Our knowledge is in areas like cartography, uh, geography, map projections, and digital elevation data. Anything we can do to help developers move up the stack and focus more on the mission and less on infrastructure is a win for us. A developer-centric platform like OpenShifts helps us move closer to the mission. The second is digital transformation. Um, a big focus area of that transformation is modernizing legacy applications. Like any enterprise, we have a lot of legacy systems but we want to help transform these systems to take full advantage of the elastic on-demand nature of the cloud. Containers have helped us re-platform these legacy applications. We also have developed a detailed assessment approach uh, called Cloud Vector to analyze different cloud and container migration approaches. The third topic is machine learning. And I think it would be illegal to give a tech talk in 2019 without mentioning machine learning. But it's important to us because of the sheer volume of data is too great for people to handle alone. There simply aren't enough eyes to look at the petabytes of data, especially for environmental missions like countering illegal fishing and wildlife poaching. In addition to developing algorithms, data scientists need a platform to quickly build pipelines, to pre-process data, to train and refine models. Then application developers need a, need a platform to deploy those container-based algorithms, whether they're TensorFlow or PyTorch or some custom model. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of innovation in the Kubernetes community around ML, and we want to leverage that. You know, as we saw talks from NASA and Volkswagen, it's, it's a, a great area of innovation. The fourth is global infrastructure. We need to deploy applications to the cloud, on, to on-premise data centers, and to the edge. We're looking at OpenShift to give us a common baseline to deploy applications anywhere. The fifth area is security automation. Given the missions we support, we need speed without sacrificing security, and we're looking for a platform to help with both. There we go. Oh. Uh -oh. Did, I, did I pop out of that? Go ahead. Okay. 
Well, I'll keep on going while we work the slides. So we talked about some of the key areas where we're using Kubernetes and OpenShift. Uh, let's dive into a couple examples, and we're gonna start with uh, edge computing and security. There we go. So as we saw from James' early examples, natural disasters can happen anywhere in the world. Uh, and the first thing you probably lose is communications back to the cloud. So when we work in disconnected environments, so, so we need to work in disconnected environments. But when the network's up, we wanna deploy applications seamlessly to the cloud, to the edge, and to data centers. We're using Kubernetes and OpenShift to provide that abstraction layer across a, across a wide variety of hardware, from ruggedized devices to hyperscale public clouds. Uh, developers can then, again, move up the stack and focus on the applications or machine learning models and not worry about the deployment infrastructure. Ah, thanks. I got you. All right. One of the, the edge devices that we're deploying OpenShift to is the AWS Snowball Edge. And if you're not familiar with the Snowball, it's a ruggedized device. It's got 100 terabytes of online storage, uh, 52 cores for running virtual machines, you can have an onboard GPU graphics card for uh, inferences or lightweight training. It's got a local S3 object store as well as data sync APIs back to the public cloud. Plus it's got handles on it so you can pick it up and drop it off at the FedEx and send it by, by the not, mail. Not that easily, but you can yeah. pick it up and drop it off. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, you can also network these devices together uh, to build larger clusters uh, for more computing power. Um, we're currently, you know, we've got this deployed on the Snowball Edge. We're also looking if there's any uh, Azure users at the Databox Edge, so that's coming up next. Let me go to the next one. Um, but in order to deploy OpenShift to these Edge devices, we had to make some changes. We had to work with the Kubernetes and the Red Hat community to adjust Kubernetes to work in private, disconnected Amazon devices. And we'll take a look at what we did next on that. Yeah. So Kubernetes has a pluggable cloud provider that allows access to AWS resources and APIs, which is great. And the next slide uh, shows the path of how AWS is accessed. Kube calls the cloud provider, which then calls the AWS Go SDK, which then calls the public um, or commercial AWS endpoints or URLs. But there's a catch. The, the Go SDK hard codes all the region names by your hard codes all the region names and URLs in an enumeration that's statically compiled into a Kube binary. There's no way to easily override these endpoints for, for edge devices or other private cloud regions. The silver lining is Kubernetes is an open source project, so we can quickly identify the problem. And I can't overstate the importance of having an open source code base as your platform uh, to troubleshoot these type of issues. You know. The fix was relatively straightforward, just a configuration file to override the values. But how do you get this fix or this pull request approved and into a Kubernetes release? Again, we're geospatial experts, and we don't work with the, the Kube community on a daily basis. This is, where, this is where support from Nick and the Red Hat team really helped. We were able to, or Red Hat was able to help us navigate the community process, as well as to help us design and fix the test. Red Hat facilitated meetings with Amazon and other community partners, and we were able to get the pull request into the next release of Kubernetes, as well as the enterprise version of OpenShift. Next. So here's a screenshot of the pull request. You know, a big shout out again to Nick and everyone at Red Hat for making this happen. Uh, we found the issue and had the fix in the next release of Kubernetes. So as Dan said, uh, the community was really important. Uh, Red Hat also added it into version three of OpenShift, even though they were releasing uh, 4.0 and that was the priority. So again, yeah, tremendous thanks to the whole Red Hat team. Uh, we couldn't have done this alone. So on the next slide, I'm gonna switch gears a bit and talk about one of our last challenges, and that's the security accreditation process. Now security is always paramount, and in highly regulated industries, new systems have to go through a lengthy uh, security accreditation process. In the government, new systems must receive and maintain an ATO. Uh, ATO stands for authority to operate, and this approval can take between six and 18 months to achieve. It involves implementing, documenting, testing, and auditing 
over 1,000 security controls. We're using OpenShift to reduce that timeline. By building on a secure, hardened Kubernetes platform, applications can inherit up to 90% of the security controls. OpenShift then becomes a common control provider by handling all the security services every application needs, like authentication, data at rest and transport encryption, auditing and logging, and so forth. By providing these common controls, applications just have to go through a SEC DevOps pipeline of static and dynamic code testing, as well as dependency analysis. If the application code passes these tests and meets a predefined risk threshold, it can receive an expedited approval to deploy to the platform. And this raises overall security bar. You know, the platform handles the infrastructure security, and the team can spend more time on application level vulnerabilities. And this diagram shows, shows one of the pipelines we have in place. Uh, so Nirvana for us would be ATO in a day, um, but our target, and we've achieved in some cases, ATO in a sprint. So in conclusion, these were just a couple examples of how we're using OpenShift to accelerate the security process and deploy to edge locations. We're using Kubernetes and OpenShift in our hybrid cloud strategy to better support missions like disaster relief. I'm gonna turn it back to James for some parting thoughts. All right, thanks, Andy. Um, just one last image to show you. This was a dam collapse um, in, in Brazil that we were asked to come in and provide imagery uh, for recovery efforts. You see here the difference between uh, September of 2018 and January 2019 when the event happened. Um, I believe this was something where it was like 1.7 million um, pounds of toxic mud and, and um, debris were spread. So we're just able to come in and show them um, exactly what needs to happen and help just in the recovery efforts as we have stated previously before. So in closing, NGA continues the efforts to deliver meaningful um, impact to our customers. Our vision is to know the earth, show the way, and understand the world. GeoWint is critical to our national security, and NGA is the lead federal agency for geospatial intelligence, responsible pro for providing world-class 21st century innovations, tools, products, and services. Thank you. All right. <laughs>